I'm heading off an hour north to Villa Farnese in Caparola, which is a small town in the province of Viterbo, about 40 miles from the center of Rome, to visit one of these great gardens made by a power-hungry cardinal. I've come to Villa Farnese mainly because I've always wanted to see it. But the reason why people have come here in such great numbers is because it is generally reckoned to be one of the most perfect examples of a surviving Renaissance garden. This was the home of Cardinal Alessandro Farnese II, of the distinguished Farnese family, whose grandfather was Pope Paul III. Pope Paul had originally commissioned the building as a fortified castle at a time when Rome was almost constantly at war. But by the time the Cardinal inherited it in 1549, all that had been built of this fortress were the five-sided footings. So in 1556, Farnese hired the architect Giacomo Vignola to build an enormous palace on these existing foundations and to create the latest fashionable accessory, a beautiful Renaissance garden. There's no doubt that we have this idea that Italian gardens are all formality, clipped hedges, green, at best, very mannered, calm, stately type of garden, but at worst, rather bleak, even hard and harsh compared to our love of flowers. And I think that's one of the things I want to know, is what were they like? How have they evolved? Is what we're seeing now a true picture of Italian gardens as they've developed through history? By the 1560s, when this garden was made, the Renaissance had been in full swing for over a hundred years and had produced an unprecedented flowering of new ideas in art, architecture, literature, science and philosophy from artists such as Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. But this wasn't just about paintings and sculpture. The Renaissance also launched the idea that a garden could be a work of art. To find out more about this garden in particular, and Renaissance gardens in general, I meet Giorgio Galetti, a garden historian who's restored a number of Renaissance gardens like Villa Farnese. The ideas of order and symmetry and harmony were key parts of Renaissance thought, weren't they? Vignola used pure geometry, and also he designed this garden on pure geometry according to a square grid. Architecture, not only garden, mm. should be based on a pure geometry. The idea of the man should recreate the harmony of the universe. And it has to be very simple and very feasible to be understood by man. Right. right. This grid-like formality might appear constraining to modern British gardeners, but it was designed to create order out of chaos, placing man in controlled and controlling harmony with nature. As you climb steep steps to the top of the garden, you leave the ordered formality behind and enter the Bosco, which was a wood designed for the Cardinal and his guests to indulge in his greatest pleasure, hunting prey ranging from wild boar to songbirds. It's best to think of the garden as a process or a journey. So you've gone from the, the ordered gardens down by the villa, then up through the Bosco, this place of excitement, of hunting, of wild animals, and nature in red in tooth and claw, but, but controlled. And then, as you come through the end of the Bosco, there's a clearing, and in front of you is this apparition. 
It's a fairy palace. It's, it's an extraordinary, rich creation rising up out the ground. And you've reached this state of absolute beauty. This is where Alessandro Farnese entertained his fellow cardinals and anyone, and in truth that was everyone, that he wished to impress. It is an astonishing ethereal fantasy. It is built from stone, water, vast riches, and an even greater ambition. The water features and sculpted cascades pointedly demonstrate his culture of sophistication, and at every turn, you can see clear symbols celebrating the greatness of the Farnese dynasty. All this fun and games was really part of power play. The most important thing that this is saying is I am a powerful man. Think of this water being channeled down in this marvelous staircase of water made by dolphins. What well, any visitor would have known, the dolphin was the crest of the Farnese family. Now, Alessandro's grandfather had been there. He'd tasted it. He'd been close to the seat of power. So he had about him this sense of right. And the garden expresses that. The river gods, the water coming from the cornucopia is going to a glass. This is the fountain of the glass. The idea of taking rivers and then drinking them, holding them in your hand. This wouldn't have gone unnoticed. So the symbolism is almost as important as the aesthetic beauty. Despite all the jostling for position that went on between cardinals, it was a very small world that they moved in, and many would dine and hunt together as friends. So when Farnese created this garden, fully 10 years after the lower gardens were completed, he turned to a fellow cardinal who himself had made a great garden nearby for some advice. This Palazzina, rather grand building, up here at the top, was recommended to Farnese by his neighbor, Cardinal Gambara, at Villa Lanti, who fundamentally said, look, old chap, you've got gout. Like me, you find it a bit tricky when you're having your dinners outside on a summer's evening, build yourself a shed at the end of the garden. So he did, very nice shed it is too. And it was up here that they would relax the power play would be done, and there would be wine and song, if not women. This garden is formed from an elaborate parterre of crisp box hedging, superb sculptures, and the delightful play of water. However, there is a notable absence of flowers of any kind. Yet according to Giorgio Galetti, Renaissance gardens, like Farnese, would originally have been filled with colour. There was a kind of symbolic flower garden, mm -hmm. particularly a, a lot of lemon pots. When there was the fashion of the bulbs, all the cardinals and princes, they were in competition yeah. to buy the, yeah. the rarest bulb. Right. And, and if you talk to most people in England now, they will say, but there are no flowers. It's all just evergreens and, and shapes. And it's very beautiful, but, but limited. So what you're saying is that was never the case? Not in the, in the Renaissance. There were jasmines, uh, crocuses, uh, lilies. That was very important for the Farnese family because it was in their, in their coat of arms. And pots of small topiary in box. So what happened to all the flowers? Villa Farnese became abandoned and overgrown when garden fashions changed and it wasn't restored until the 20th century. In many gardens like Farnese, the only planting to survive was the box hedging, which in fact was often not original. So restorers assumed that Renaissance gardens were flowerless. It is quite a shock when you realize that the image of the Renaissance garden is actually inaccurate. It wasn't like that. And that they wouldn't have used box and it, it wouldn't have been green and they would have had flowers. And when I came to this top section, I stood here for a bit thinking, well, I don't get it. I just don't 
feel any response to this rather flat open space and the green grass. And it wasn't until I learned that actually it wasn't like this. It was full of flowers. It was like a physic garden with beds, with beautiful specimens that they were gathering and, and were being given as presents. When you think about it, why shouldn't Renaissance gardeners have enjoyed flowers every bit as much as we did? And I need to undo these preconceptions I have of Italian gardens as being all about shape and structure and form and start to fill in the, the gaps with flowers and the pleasure of flowers just like I have in my own garden. Alessandro died in 1589, just a few years after the Palazzina was completed. But his garden remained hugely influential, particularly to his fellow cardinals, vying to outdo each other with the magnificence of their gardens.